Based on our reading today, can you guess what we're going to talk about? And, yeah, we're, yeah, baptism, right? No. So today we're going to talk, we are going to talk about communion, the Lord's Supper today. Uh, and it's, day, it's the end of daylight savings, so of course I have an extra hour to preach. I've been telling that to everybody this morning. It's not my joke, but it's a good joke anyway. Uh, so as we look at this, different churches, different denominations have different words for the things that they do, the ceremonial things, the traditional things that we do. Some churches will use the word sacraments. You've probably heard that word before. Catholic churches, Lutheran, Anglican, Orthodox. These are among those churches that will have sacraments. The sacraments in those churches vary a little bit, but they'll, they'll tend to include uh, baptism, generally infant baptism, confession or reconciliation, communion, the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, the Eucharist, the name varies a little bit. Confirmation, some of you may have been confirmed in another church at some other time in your life. That usually happens when people are about 12 or 13 years old. Uh, there's marriage or matrimony is often a sacrament of the churches. Holy orders or ordination, becoming a priest or becoming a nun in that church is considered a sacrament. Uh, when I was little growing up in the Catholic Church, uh, we called the last one the last rites. Uh, they cha- I think they changed the name to the anointing of the sick now. I'm not sure why, but they did. Um, so those are just kind of those sacraments that some of the churches out there will follow. Uh, but we're a Baptist church. If you guys didn't know, that's what the B in FBC stands for. So just make sure you're in the right place. Now, there are hundreds, probably thousands, to be honest with you, different types of Baptist churches in, just in the United States today. And it can be difficult to, to piece all that together and to understand it. Uh, frankly, when I took my one semester of Baptist heritage in seminary, that just kind of touched the surface of the differences between different Baptist churches. But as Baptists, we don't have sacraments. We have what we call ordinances, What is the difference between a sacrament and an ordinance? That's a great question. Thank you for asking. Generally speaking, a sacrament is something that is required for salvation, whereas an ordinance is something important that we do, but it is is symbolic. It's not a condition of our salvation. Now, again, that's a very general statement. So, be careful if you go talk to your Lutheran friend this afternoon about what, what pa- Baptist Pastor Mike said, okay? Um, in, in some Lutheran churches, for example, baptism wouldn't be considered required for salvation. It's a vital thing for them to do. Uh, some Lutheran churches, it's required. You can't be saved unless you're baptized. Some Lutheran churches will tell you, well, no, you, you can believe in Jesus. If you're not baptized, it's, it's okay. Uh, but again, generally speaking, that's just kind of the difference between those. But here, we're going to talk about ordinances today, since we're not Lutheran, we're not Catholic, we're, we're a Baptist church. We're going to talk about ordinances. I'm going to spend this week and next talking about the two ordinances that we have uh, here in our church. Today, we're going to talk about the Lord's Supper or communion, which we'll participate in in a little while. Next week, I'm going to talk about baptism. There are some churches out there that will recognize a third ordinance. Does anybody know what that third ordinance might be? Any guess? Nobody's brave today. Accepting the Holy Spirit? Accepting the Holy Spirit? Um, I would say it's, it's a requirement of salvation, but it wouldn't be considered an ordinance. An ordinance is kind of a, a, a sort of an outward thing that we do. So we gather for communion. We have baptism. The third ordinance in some churches is actually foot washing. You guys heard this before? is foot washing. This comes right from chapter 13 of John's gospel. Uh, As they're sitting down for the Lord's Supper, Jesus washes his disciples' feet as an act of service to them. So we're, we're looking at verses 14 and 15 now from John chapter 13. Jesus says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do just as I have done for you. So just as we're commanded to partake in communion, in the Lord's Supper, just as as we're we're commanded to repent and be baptized, here Jesus is specifically telling his disciples to wash one another's feet. You think we should start including that? I 
I, I, that's kind of gross. Kind of, you know, honestly, I'll be, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I don't really want to do that. And most churches today kind of take this, this command not so much as an ordinance, but more as something that, that we metaphorically need to do good for other people. There was a very practical reason for Jesus to wash his disciples' feet that night. They were dirty, right? And for, for a table in the first century, you're not so much sitting on a chair and having a table around. You're, kind of, you're closer to the floor. You're reclining on pillows. And your feet might be a little bit closer to somebody's face. So it's really important to wash, wash your feet. But there are some churches that do it as an ordinance, some will do it just as an act of service, as an act of humility, not quite rising to this level of importance uh, of the Lord's Supper or of baptism. But as we approach Easter here in a few months, it's, it's going to be closer than you think. So not even Christmas, but Easter is going to be coming quickly. But as we approach Easter in a few months, you might hear a story about the Pope, the, the big guy over in Rome, right? The Pope, Pope, that guy. He will go to a prison in Rome and wash the feet of 12 prisoners, as a, a sign of humility on his part. And he'll do this on uh, Holy Thursday or Monday Thursday, which is when Jesus did it for his disciples. Today, though, we're talking about one of our two ordinances, the Lord's Supper or communion. I want to kind of go over two main points today. We're going to first talk about a problem that was in the church of Corinth that we read about today. Uh, and then we're going to talk specifically about the Lord's Supper, what it means. I'll discuss some of the basics of it today, and I'll also kind of dig a little deeper into it as well. Now, I went with this reading from 1 Corinthians as opposed to one, a reading from one of the Gospels because it's probably the earliest written record of the Lord's Supper. So you look at the Gospels, they were probably written around between 55 and 70 there's some debate on that, of course. 1 Corinthians was likely written around 50 to 55. So this, this record predates the writing, at least, of the Gospels. And Paul isn't so much writing to the Corinthians to say, hey, you guys need to do this. He's not saying, he's not telling them about the Lord's Supper. They already know about the Lord's Supper. They're already celebrating it, remembering it in some way, but they're not doing it properly. If you have your Bibles open, I always encourage you to follow along. I am in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to read just a few verses for you here, starting at verse 17. I'm going to kind of go over these quickly. Um, 11, 17. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. Verse 20. So then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. There's a problem in the church of Corinth, but it's not a theological problem. It's a social problem. If you've read all of 1 Corinthians before, uh, you might remember that at the very beginning of this letter, Paul is addressing division within the church in Corinth. Because some of the people in, in Corinth are saying, well, I follow Paul, I follow Peter, I follow Apollos. And what's really likely happening here, because Paul and Apollos and Peter, they're not giving a different message about Jesus. They're all saying Jesus is Lord. But what's likely happening is it's not a theological debate. They're all saying the same thing. In the first century, there is a lot of weight placed on how someone presents a point. There is a lot of emphasis on the way they debate. Not so much even what they're debating, but how they're debating, how they're discussing things. So with that in mind, there's probably one group in, the, in this church that says, you know, I really like how Paul said that. And then there's another group that says, well, I, but I like the way Peter presents the same idea, so I'm, I'm a fan of Peter. Yeah, but Apollos has a really beautiful speaking voice, and I like the way he says Jesus is Lord, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow that Apollos guy. And honestly, we kind of have some of these same divisions in churches today. One group likes modern worship. One group likes traditional worship. One group will say, I only listen to hymns. Another group will say, well, I like contemporary music. There is no theological difference in any of that. 
Peter, Apollos, Paul, modern worship, traditional worship, hymns, contemporary Christian music, gospel music, all of these say that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The church in Corinth has division. And with the Lord's Supper, again, it's not a theological problem. They're all on the same page here. It's a social problem. Corinth is in modern-day Greece. If you want to get a picture of where Corinth is in your head. Society in first century Corinth, in first century in general, was very, very structured. Uh, the rich will stay with the rich. The poor will stay with the poor. Uh, and frankly, that, that does exist today. It not, might not be as, as much of a social structure as it was then. But if you can afford a nice house, you're probably going to buy a nice house and live in a nice neighborhood. You're not going to come live with me over in some apartments or anything like that. Anyway, I'm not sure why I went down that route. Uh, but when Christianity comes along, so when Christianity comes along, when people start to follow the way of Jesus, these structures are supposed to disappear. People are welcome in the church whether they have a lot of money or whether they have no money. People are welcome if they have a nice suit to wear or they've, they've only got torn blue jeans. For some people, the nicest pair of pants they own might be a pair of blue jeans with only one hole in the knee. Someone's clothes should never be a barrier to Jesus. How much money someone has should never be a barrier to Jesus. How much food someone has should never be a hindrance to fellowship. And that's where the problem comes in for the people at the church in Corinth. When they get together to remember the Lord's Supper, um, they aren't just putting out bread or crackers and, and wine or juice and making that part of their worship. It's how we remember it today. It's how we will be remembering it here in, in just a little while. But for Corinth, they would gather together for a full meal as the Lord's Supper. And they would probably do this as part of that meal. The problem that they were having is that the people ate what they brought. We're not talking about one of our potlucks. So we have a potluck. Some, somebody's going to bring a big old crock pot full of meatballs or beans, right? Somebody else, maybe all they can afford to bring is like a, a single sleeve of crackers or a small bag of chips. Do we look at that person that, well, all you brought was, you know, like a half a sleeve of crackers, so you, can't, you can only eat a half a sleeve of crackers? Of course not. It doesn't matter what you bring. You get to participate in our dinner, right? Whether you, you brought anything, you can bring nothing to the potluck, and you can still have a meal with us. But the wealthy of the church in Corinth were following normal societal practices. They brought the food so they get to eat. The poor had nothing, so they got to eat nothing. Paul is telling them this is completely against the idea of gathering for the Lord's Supper because the table of the Lord is open to everyone. That's likely the problem of division within the church in Corinth. Division between the rich and the poor. Division between those that have and those that have not. It's not a problem of belief in Jesus. It's a problem of the world creeping into the church. There are a few other verses here that we need to look at as well. I'm going to be reading verses 27 through 29 here. Starting in verse 27. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. These are a few verses that can cause some problems because they're kind of scary sounding. Often you'll hear someone talk about this section and they'll say, if you have sin in your life, or if you're not truly a believer, or if you're not a member of our local church, you are violating this command of Paul. I don't think any of us here want to participate in the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Do we? I don't. 
But what does Paul really mean here when he says that? Everyone ought to examine themselves. Are we to ask ourselves if we have sin in our life before we take communion? Is that what Paul is saying? Does it mean that if there is sin in our life, we should forego participating in the Lord's Supper until we rectify the sinful behavior? Let me say this, if that's what he's saying, if he's saying if you have sin in your life, you can't participate in the Lord's Supper, none of us would ever get to participate because there is sin in each of us. We are human. Humans sin. So I don't think that's the self-examination that Paul is suggesting here. He just got done telling us that the problem in the Corinthian church is the societal, the social division from the world that has come into the church. I believe the examination that we need to do, that Paul is saying here, is we need to ask ourselves if we're excluding someone from fellowship for a social reason, for a reason that has nothing to do with Jesus. Now, communion itself is for believers. Communion is for believers in Jesus. It's for us to remember his sacrifice on the cross, It's not appropriate for non-believers to participate. But we can't say to someone, you can't come to the table because of this thing I don't like about you. You can't join our fellowship because you're not part of our social circle. Just as salvation is available to anyone who believes, the table of the Lord is open to all who profess belief in Christ. I remember when I was first going to church when I was in high school. As I've said, I grew up Roman Catholic. We left the church. I started going to a Baptist church in Fargo when I was about 15. And I remember the pastor standing up at the pulpit before communion, and he would say basically what I say, that you don't have to be a member of the church to participate in communion. You just have to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And I remember sitting in the back of the church each of those Sundays I heard this, And I had to decide if I was a Jesus follower. I had to ask myself each time if I actually knew Jesus. Clearly, I I didn't at the time. But every time I said that, it's like, well, I'm in church, so I must believe in Jesus. Was I taking communion in an unworthy manner? Possibly. Did I die because of it? Was I unable to be saved because of it? No. So if there's, if there's sin in our life, so when we talk about that unworthy manner of taking communion, I think Paul is saying, how are you interacting with your fellow Christians? Are you including everyone on all that you're doing? Or are you saying, well, you guys over there, I, I, don't, I don't like the shirt you wear. I, I don't like the pants you wear. I don't like something about you. It's to include everyone in that fellowship. So what exactly is the Lord's Supper? What is communion? What are we remembering when we partake? I want to go back and we'll we'll look at what the Gospels say about this. I'm going to read from something you might not be familiar with. Uh, Has anyone heard of the harmony of the Gospels? Maybe a few of you have heard of a harmony of the Gospels. Because we have the same story in all of the Gospels, we have the story of Jesus in all of the Gospels, told a little bit differently, Uh, what some authors have done is they've taken the the Gospels and they've put them side by side by side by side in a book. And I know you can't see this unless you're sitting right here, but there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John right next to one another, the same story. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that story from all four Gospels combined and read it to you Now, when he was gone, the he that is being referred to here is Judas, when he was gone, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, take it, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. And they all drank from it. 
This is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. He said to them, I tell you the truth, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. So if you've been in church at all, you've heard that read in some way before. Jesus and the disciples are sitting down to a ceremonial dinner for Passover called the Seder. Passover, this dinner, dates back to the exodus and of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. And I do want to give you a real quick review of that. So I'm going to cover most of Genesis and pretty much all of Exodus. Are you guys ready? Okay, let's see how we do. We start with Abraham as a patriarch of the Israelites. He has a son, Isaac. Isaac has a son, Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons from which we get the 12 tribes of Israel. One of Jacob's sons is named Joseph, and he is Jacob's favorite son. The other brothers are jealous of this naturally. This is why as parents probably shouldn't have favorite children, or at least don't tell them which one is your favorite. And the brothers then sell Joseph into slavery. Joseph winds up in Egypt, where after a while, I'm skipping big chunks here, by the way. I'm not telling the whole story. You can go read the whole story. After a while, he interprets a dream that, uh, that Pharaoh has about an upcoming famine. Joseph is put in charge of preparing for the famine, and these preparations work wonderfully. Now we think back about Joseph's brothers and his father Jacob. They too are affected by the famine, but they hear there is food in Egypt. So some of them go to get food. They don't recognize their brother at first, but eventually they do, and the family is reunited in Egypt. So now in Egypt, we have all these Israelites living there, and they're quite prosperous, and they're having a whole bunch of little baby Israelites. And after Pharaoh, after the Pharaoh that likes Joseph, after the Pharaoh that uh, was, was in charge when Joseph was there and the Israelites came, after he dies, we get a Pharaoh that forgot what Joseph has done, that doesn't like the Israelites and fears their growth. So all of the Israelites are enslaved. After a while, this fellow named Moses comes along, and he goes to Pharaoh, and with what I assume is a Charlton Heston accent, he says, let my people go. He says that a few times, and Pharaoh keeps saying no to that. Then God said he is going to send death, and he's going to kill the firstborn male everything, including the firstborn male of all the Israelites. The Israelites are a little upset about that. And then God says, well, if you kill a lamb and you paint the doorframe with the blood of this lamb, Death will pass over that house, and everyone inside will be spared. Death comes, Pharaoh's son dies, then the Israelites get to leave, then we have the Red Sea thing, then we have the wandering in the desert, and the manna and the quail, and then we have a lot more wandering, and eventually we have the Israelites getting to the promised land. In this time of wandering, God tells the Israelites to always remember what he did for them. To always remember that because God loves his creation, death passed over them. So they gather every year to remember the Passover. It's not just a clever name. It's called the Passover because death passed over them, right? That is what Jesus and the disciples have gathered to remember on this night. We're going to start really basic, and then we're going to build from there. Jesus takes bread, he gives thanks, breaks the bread, tears it apart, passes it to his disciples, and he says, this is my body. To us, this is symbolic. It is a representation of Christ's body. We tend to say here how it represents how his body will be broken for us as he is crucified. And when we eat the bread, we are to remember how Jesus willingly went to the cross so that our sins would be forgiven. I'm going to give you your Jeopardy word for the day. Are you ready? Some of you might know this one. The Jeopardy word for the day is transubstantiation. Transubstantiation. There will be a quiz later. Transubstantiation. This is a belief generally in the Roman Catholic Church that when the priest blesses the bread and the cup, the bread and the wine literally become the body and blood of Jesus. Jesus said, this is my body. He said, this is my blood. 
So if you ever go to a Catholic Mass, uh, it, watch closely how the priest treats the elements at that Mass. It's really fascinating to watch when you know this, um, how he treats the, the bread, how he treats the cup after he blesses it. Now, we don't, we don't have that belief as Baptists. Um, we believe when Jesus said, this is my body, he was being symbolic. He was being metaphorical. So the, the Jeopardy word of the day is transubstantiation. Very good. I like just putting other things out there. I think it's important for us to understand what other religious groups believe, what they, what they practice. We're back at the table now after Jesus has passed the bread. He then takes a cup and he gives thanks. He turns to his disciples and he tells them to drink from the cup, which would, of course, contain wine, and that wine represents his blood. Today we use grape juice here in our church. It's symbolic of the blood that Jesus will shed on the cross. And we're told that when we do this, when we eat the bread, when we drink from the cup, we are remembering what Jesus did for us on the cross. His body was broken. His blood was shed so that our sins would be forgiven. Those are really the basics of the basics of the Lord's Supper, is to remember and to proclaim to others what Jesus has done for us. Let's dive a little deeper now. The more I read about the Lord's Supper, the more fascinated I am with all the symbolism of it and kind of how incredible it really is. We can look at the basics of it, but then we start to dive a little deeper and look at the connection between Passover and our connection here to God. As we remember, this ties in with Passover. The disciples are gathered for this Seder dinner. And on the table, there would be several things that are sitting out. The disciples, as Israelites, would recognize all of these things set out on the table. Among them would be a Seder plate. On that Seder plate, you'd have bitter herbs, you'd have a hard-boiled egg, you'd have a paste made of apples, pears, nuts, and wine. You'd have a slice of vegetable, such as an onion. You'd have a few other things. These all have meaning in the Seder, which I'm not going to go over this morning. On the table, you'd also see four wine glasses as part of the ceremony. And you would see matzah, which is unleavened bread, along with whatever else is placed on the table. For us, we're going to recognize that matzah, that bread, and the cup, the wine. And I've been able to, to piece together a few things from the Seder tradition that I think are important for us to understand. I'm sure I'm missing a lot, so don't, don't go home and say, I learned everything there is to know about the Passover today. We're learning a little bit today. When we think about the bread, when we think about the matzah, we remember Jesus saying, this is my body. Why did Jesus break the bread? Was it just symbolic of what he did or what he was about to do on the cross? Actually, it seems like it's part of the tradition of the Seder. I found a few sources online. Several sources tell us the same thing. This author put it really clearly. There's actually three pieces of matzah sitting on the table. And we're told, we break the middle matzah in two to represent suffering. The broken piece of matzah represents many things. It is an example of the price of freedom. We recognize that freedom does not always come easily and is often fragmented in its early stages. So Jesus takes this bread, this bread that represents suffering, and breaks it as part of the tradition of the Seder, and he says, this is my body. Remember what Jesus is about to go through over the next 24 hours. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be imprisoned. He's going to be scourged. He's going to be crucified. He's going to die. He suffers and dies on the cross. The matzah that represents suffering is his body. Let's look at the wine now. Let's look at the cup. As I mentioned, there are four wine glasses on the table. Matthew and Mark uh, both mention just one glass of, of wine. They, they both say he took a cup. 
It doesn't mean there's not more on the table, but it says he took a cup. Luke, uh, in his gospel, mentions at least two cups. Uh, In chapter 22, he starts out by saying, after taking the cup, he gave thanks, and he took bread, gave thanks, broke it. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. So as with everything, there are some different ideas about the, the meanings of the four cups, but one thought here says the four cups symbolize the freedom of the Israelites from four exiles. One author says it's from the Egyptian, Babylonian, and Greek exiles. And he goes on to say, our current exile, which we hope to be rid of soon with the coming of Messiah. Now, Jewish people don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. We do believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So Jewish people are still looking for the coming of the Messiah. And if that tradition is the same or very similar to the time of Jesus, this final cup represents the coming of the Messiah. And if Jesus takes that final cup to institute this practice of the Lord's Supper, are you catching what I'm trying to say? Are you picking up on this? Now, I'm making a bit of an assumption here that Jesus is using that fourth cup toward the end of the Seder. But if we look at Matthew's Gospel, uh, just after Jesus uh, institutes this idea of, of the Lord's Supper, just after he says, this is my body, just after he says, this is my blood, in Matthew 26, after all that is done, it says, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So when we read it, I'm thinking that all of this is taking place toward the end of the Seder dinner, which would mean we're probably at that time of that fourth ceremonial cup symbolizing the Messiah. And Jesus takes that cup and he says, this is my blood. This is me. I am the Messiah. 